This is the special board meeting of August 4, 2021. It is now 4.37. We will begin roll call, please, Mary. President Lay. Here. Vice President Edetta. Here. Clerk Chavez. Here. Member Cortese. Here. Member Doe. Here. Item 1.02, are there any members of public who would like to provide public comment to the board on a closed session agenda item at this time? Seeing none, hear none. So the board will now recess to close session. We will be come back at 6.15. Thank you. Welcome to special board meeting of August 4, 2021. We apologize, we ran a little bit late today. And uh, now I'd like to welcome everyone. A member of the public, please submit your public comment online by accessing the form of the district homepage, www.esuhsd.org or the link on the agenda. Please limit your written comments to no more than 1,000 characters in length. Public comments submitted online will be read into the record. You may also raise your virtual hand in Zoom to request to speak. You will have two minutes to speak. Please note, all meetings are recorded. All regular and special meetings of the Boards of Trustee and Board Study Session are streamed live on meeting nights and are also available for viewing the day after the meeting by accessing the district YouTube channel listed on the district webpage at www.esuhsd.org under the quick links section. The board is not able to respond to items that are not on the agenda or any personal issues. Your comment will be read into the record and will be directed to the superintendent and or the appropriate staff member for respond. Interpretation of this meeting in Spanish and Vietnamese can be heard by accessing the link and following the instructions shown on the agenda and a district website. All right, so now we're gonna have the adoption of the agenda 5.01. The superintendent and the board members may request that items be removed from the agenda for consideration and or carry to a future board meeting for consideration and or action and or that the board take action in a regular meeting on a subject not listed on the published agenda on an emergency basis or other basis allowed by law. Gov code 54954.2. So we move to- Board President. Oh, yes. Administration is requesting that we remove item 1402. Okay, so we move uh, item 14. 0.02 to the next board meeting. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Superintendent. Any other requests? If I don't see anyone have requests, then we have to adopt it, dear Chandler. No, we have to move on, right? Okay. All right, so 14.02. Yes. And uh, we don't have any more special recognition as well as student board liaison because school will start next week. Um, so we have a student governing board representative as our next board meeting on August 19. So we move on to 8.01. Um, the superintendent and board member may request the item be considered, discussed and acted on out of the order indicated on the agenda as per schedule. Any item need to be um, acted on out of the order? I've seen none. Then, then we move to 8.02, presentation, discussion, and action to receive Citizen Bond Oversight Committee 2019 to 2020 Bond Program Annual Report for Measure G, E, I, Technology I, and Z. Mr. Chris Chu, Associate Superintendent of Business Services, and Julio Lucas, Senior Manager of the Bond Program, and Mr. Raymond Muller, Chair of Citizen Bond Oversight Committee. Please take it over. Impressive. <laughs> there you I would go. like to start by wishing you all a happy Silicon Valley Pride Month. I am hoping that there will be a resolution from this board to honor that event this month. Thank you. Now, 
as the next chat, sorry, Citizens Bond Oversight Chair. Damn it. Shouldn't leave it on, there we go. Um, I'm here to present our annual report. It's the first time I've done this for this board, so please forgive me. I have training in a elementary school district, so if I act a little bit childish, they'll understand. Our report is a very professional looking, and I do wanna make sure I start by acknowledging new and the staff because we look good because they do all of this fabulous work. Um, you'll notice on this, I wanna thank, thank her as well because we have this uh, QR code at the very top. Every one of you has access to that code. Please make sure that you put it onto your personal um, social networks and put it out to the community because that is how they can access this report when we put it online tomorrow, right? Thank you. We can't put it online until I present it to you. So please note that QR code is available to you for your own use and so we can save a few trees. All right, if I can, I'd like to go ahead and start. Um, I'm gonna flip through this. I'm not gonna read it all verbatim, but I did wanna read the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee's statement. I get this on, don't I? I can do this. Citizens Bond Oversight Committee is a group of parent, neighbor, resident, and taxpayer volunteers who are the watchdog for our community. We oversee the spending of over a billion dollars in funding, which was approved by voters in support of our East Side children. As one of the largest districts in the county, East Side Union High School District is a launch pad for the youth of our neighborhoods and our infrastructure and facilities require continued repair and improvement to ensure the success of all who depend upon these campuses. During this historic COVID quarantine, the construction sector was essential and the work of these bond projects did continue with all mandated protocols in place to provide the contractors and their staff safe workspaces. The annual report details how our tax dollars have been used to prepare our campus communities for success as the students and staff return for in-person education, cross your fingers, and recreational opportunities. Please let us know if you have any questions or if you would like us to join you for, or if you'd like to join us for our next quarterly meeting. Um, I do want to acknowledge that we have not had a member of this committee at our meetings much lately. We did used to have Frank all the time and we had you last year, um, Lorena. If there is supposed to be a liaison, it would be nice if that liaison were part of the ongoing. If there's not a liaison, it'd be great if we had one. Because when we have questions, we could ask you directly. My understanding is that we're not actually allowed to have a liaison. Is that, Mr. Jew, is that correct? Well, Frank was doing that, Lorena was doing that, we didn't need him? Ooh, we could have got away with a whole lot more. Out of, out of habit, you were part of us. Okay. Well, um, that's good to know. Thank you, appreciate that clarification. All right, moving forward. This is a long report. I'm gonna try and make it as short as possible. I do wanna make sure that we introduce the committee's changes. Um, so we did wanna make sure that we add very specific points of how the bond funds are spent and where do they come from and how is the neighborhood school impacted, who is responsible, why it's a requirement to have the oversight and how can a person take a seat at this table? Is it moving forward? Who's got this? You're on it? Oh, there we go, look at that. There's the questions. We're trying to make this as simple as possible so that people, when they see it, do not immediately look at 5,000 words and go, I'm not reading this report. So we figured if we highlighted the very specific reasons why it's important that they take a look at what we're writing, some more people would be willing to do that. Um, the uh, next section here, I have to flip pages before you do, I think. So um, the next few pages are that dry stuff. So we made that a little bit more colorful as well, made sure there were some good charts and stuff. And this is all the financial information on pages two, three, and four. On page five, we do have where they come from. And we did want to put in the sample tax bill and the tax rate info so people could again find out how they're paying for them and how they're involved. Pages six and seven are the background of the bond measures and an overview, um, which is kind of important because a lot of people don't realize. Whoop, is that right? Six and seven, there we go. Um, because again, some of the folks that have recently moved in may not realize that someone in their house voted yes or no on this years ago and they're gonna be paying for it whether they like it or not. Okay. Um, I particularly wanna bring back to that page that showed the schools and the years that they were built. I think that's a brilliant 
Yes, ma'am. Ray, if you're more comfortable, you can take your mask off while you're presenting. It, can I? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Oh, by the way, Keith Herring, in case you missed it. Okay. Thank you. Um, that is much easier, yeah, into what I'm doing. All right. So um, please take a look at that and note how old some of our schools are, how old most of our schools are. Sorry. <clears throat> Let me get rid of that. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, no, <laughs> it's great when we don't have an audience. Um, so it's important that we are all aware of the fact that the bond funds are getting smaller and smaller. And Frank, if he were here, would be here to remind us that he did try to get, you know, uh, a parcel tax passed and that didn't pass, but he at the time was already talking about the next time we were gonna be needing bond funds. It has been my opinion all along that some people write this report to be a tool for that purpose. And although, yes, this can be used for that, it wasn't written for that. So I'm pointing out a few things that I think are important to you folks who will need to sell that later on down the line, as far as this tool that we're providing you. Um, there have been some bond oversight committees that I have sat on where it was a rubber stamp situation. And basically, we don't have a whole lot of things to say about this. We are provided with a report which this body pays for and the uh, various audits and such and all of that's paid for by you and we just say okay it looks good so but we did want to make sure that this was available and had good information because we are moving towards the point where we are going to be having to talk about that again and we are going to need more money because our schools are still getting older and we have more children coming through and we're going to need more of those funds so um, now you'll notice that it does show our CBOC activities up there, which does show the schools that we were able to visit, I believe, and oh, look at that. There's a lot of information. Um, we did have a couple of new folks join us last year, uh, and we had one of our former members actually rejoin us this year, but most of you know Barry. Uh, he came back to us this year, um, which we're all very thankful for his experience and uh, his uh, perspective that is different than mine, which is good. <laughs> Um, we, we, we balance each other up. Um, for those of you who didn't realize, however, we're recycling board members, CBOC members. We live in a community that's giant, and yet we're recycling the same people over and over again. It would be nice if we could get some new blood. So again, please mention to everybody that we accept the applications year round, and there are positions available that are not specifically bond oversight committee, but associate members, check our bylaws. We can have associate members who could sit in on our meetings and take part and learn about it. And then next year when we need them as a full member, we can put them in as a full member. So if you have someone that's slightly interested, please ask them to join us. Um, okay, so um, next things, uh, pages eight and nine are the technology highlights and updates, which is usually the most fun part of our meetings. And that gentleman is not here, he's probably somewhere in the back doing the technology. Um, I gotta tell you that the technology is exceptional. All the work that's being done, the, the east side Wi-Fi, you can go out into the neighborhoods and actually have Wi-Fi in houses that don't have it, brilliant. And these partnerships are, are wonderful. And again, this is an advertising tool because we need new partnerships on these. But um, if you're not bragging about this, you should be, so. Oh, by the way, hello, nice to meet you, sir. I know everybody else already. <laughs> Good. Um, bond projects and planning, design, construction is the next page there. And, and again, I'm, I'm just covering things and, and talking kind of off script. Um, you will all have plenty of time to read all of the verbiage, but I also wanna make sure that you note, again, the photography and such is all new. Um, when, when we were going through the report and said we needed more stuff, that's where it came from, which, right? Thank you. So please be sure to thank her, uh, Chris. Thank you. Um, Cause I think he's actually the photographer on some of these. Um, we have, or we actually even got a new picture of the group to add to this. All right, so pages 10 and 11 is again, just um, provides a description of the bond projects currently in design or in construction across the district. And the design build process has been being used quite a bit. And we have found, according to Chris, that is a very efficient model and it's working well, including that lovely new building out in front here, which we were able to tour at our last meeting when we got to sit back there. Yes, I'm practicing. Um, 
Um, we did hold our meeting here actually a couple of weeks ago and we were able to go in and view that space. It's wonderful stuff that's going on. You know? So page 10, 12 and 13 highlight the Yerba Buena High School Student Union. Now, I was trying to figure out why we were highlighting this because I know in 2018, I sat at the opening of this event because they needed some time for it to be used and get some feedback. So there's actual feedback from some of the students on this as well. I think it's a brilliant addition to this report because we've always talked about what's been done and talked about who did it and talked about who paid for it, but we didn't talk about who used it and let them talk. So we have quotes from students in this report saying how much they appreciate the work that's being done as well. Um, you will notice here that we do have board recognition. Wait, what is that? Oh yes, the awards. Now we have to go back to Chris and all the awards. Um, so are those on display somewhere in the building? Does anyone see those? Good, good to know. Um, the work that is being done is not just something that I'm proud of and that we as a group should be proud of, but it's work that people are recognizing outside of our sphere and coming in and giving awards for. So again, very important point for us because not only are we spending a billion dollars, we're doing it in such a way that people are noticing that it's good stuff. Um, the Wi-Fi program, as I understand it, and the ability of this district to get the laptops out when we got shut down last year has been an example now that's being used in a broader space. And they're looking at how they can expand that out to larger spaces and using this as an example. So thank you for the Measure I technology bond. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and move on here. We've got, um, Pages 12, 13, so um, it did receive the design build, space is utilized and appreciated by the students. And there were several quotes, but the one I wanted to do was, the student union has become a place where all my friends can chill, hang out and do homework. What kids find that at their schools? You know? It's comfortable, it's safe. So I think that's a good point to be made. Pages 14 and 15, sir. So this provides a list of all the completed projects funded by bond measures, and I believe they are by school. Please note we didn't do all of these in the last two years. That's just a compiled list. And page 16, your community at work. And so here's where we come back to that whole, we need more bodies. So I'm going to ask for all of you to pledge to me that you will over the next, before our next quarterly meeting, try and get somebody interested. Um, I'm fun to work with, really. You can ask a couple of people here. Um, I think that every leader should work not only to lead, but to provide inspiration to get somebody to want their chair. And that's how I work. I want someone to want to take my chair other than somebody who's already been in it. So I'm hoping that we will find some people who will be interested in sitting on and those associate members, because I believe we have a right to have two of them. And it would be brilliant if we could have that happen, get them intrigued, get them interested, and maybe we can bring one of those new people from this year in as the chair and then have one of those people step in their seat, okay? Um, how to get involved is listed on the report. Also, where to find more information, the QR code and the bond web website. So I do wanna reiterate that QR code was designed because two years ago when we did this report, I complained as a citizen and taxpayer my son started going to school here. Suddenly I saw this report. And until my son was of age to go to the school, I never saw this report. And I never knew about the billion dollars that our family was paying towards out of the house that we bought in 2010. I find it offensive that we only send it to the parents. I think that it is vital that it gets out to every tax paying household. So we need to figure out that. Scan code was done in such a way that we can actually create a poster that we put up as flyers throughout the district or we can put them, but we need to figure out how we tell the people who are paying our bills, this is what you're paying for. So I'm bringing that point to you because we create the port report. It's your job to ensure that those people get it, I believe. So I'm gonna ask you to think, take on that problem, figure it out because it, you shouldn't be sending it just to the parents because that's a very small percentage. There's, a, there's people living up on that hill that haven't had a child in school for years. Mm -hmm. um, and so my point being, they wouldn't even get that report, yet they're still paying for that same bond that they voted for years ago, okay? 
Are there any questions on the report itself? <clears throat> Could you summarize in a sentence or two the bottom line of oversight regarding the bond program for citizens? I want to know that it's on the up and up and you know, what's the what's the bottom line one or two sentences? Um, well, that's sort of what we covered in the first beginning, but Sorry, could you basically slow down a little bit, please. Um, what's up? Could you slow down a little bit? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. I had my mask on then too. Yeah. So the bonds, first of all, are presented to the public. They vote on those. They say, yes, we can put out a bond. The school district sells bonds, uses that funding to fix the schools and the infrastructure. It does not use that funding for any payroll of any school employees or anything operational. The bonds, when they're voted on, have a requirement of either a majority or a supermajority. If you do not get a supermajority of people to approve it, you are required to have a citizens bond oversight committee. That committee will be one person from a retirement group, one person from a parent teacher association, one person who is just a parent, one person who is with the taxpayers group. So is the district faithfully carrying out what the voters intended? And yes, currently we are carrying out what the voters intended and what is stipulated. Okay. That's the kind of bottom line that I think the community just needs to drill well, down, focus on. It, it is, um, but it's important also they understand that it doesn't happen without them. It doesn't so, happen without Yes, them. you're doing what you're supposed to. Yes, me and seven, six other volunteers are doing what we're supposed to, but they are still responsible for reading the product and keeping up with it and making sure that we continue to do that job. Thank you. I don't want to let them off by saying it's just being done for them. Thank you for your service. Yeah. You're really Thank one you. of the premier uh, folks in the community that keep stepping up uh, for serving and yep. it's much appreciated. Um, and, and I enjoy it. Um, as you all may have heard, however, I have taken a real job. That's <laughs> another reason why I'm thinking about segueing out of this eventually. Um, so I'm hoping that we will again find some new recruits. Yeah, I want to say that uh, I attend several times, you know, at the uh, Citizen um, One Oversight Committee and uh, you know, staff and also the committee member has been working very hard. And um, that is the uh, successful of the project that when you see that all the building has been built, all of those projects has been completed. And uh, I think that is uh, something that we should be proud of. Um, and I know that all of this, uh, you know, members has been uh, participate in several years and come back to to join again for the committee and i'm really uh, appreciate you know the time and commitment for all board members uh, that involved it in the citizens uh, bond oversight committee and i think that uh, we probably going to have uh, take some time to visit one of those uh, building has been built uh, because you know with covid-19 and all of those things have been happening uh, but i think that uh, we should start all over again uh, that is something that I really treasure uh, to look at all of those projects being complete and being built and how how happy the student when they see that building, you know, uh, has been changing the new look and new face, you know, in their community as well in their school. So uh, that's my uh, comments. Open it for uh, board member Cortizi. Thank you. Yes, Ray, thank you for your service. And uh, I can attest that you are fun to work with. Um, my question is for the superintendent. Um, do we know if this is or will be posted on our Facebook page, the district's Facebook page? So interestingly, we are looking not just at Facebook, but we're at the bond program where we're, we're going to meet and talk about how we can definitely share this to more people in the area with not just our students and our families, mm -hmm. but the folks that all in different methodologies and means of doing it. Right. Well, I had made a commitment to take whatever's on the district's Facebook page and share it on mine. So I will, if it's there, I will share it. That would be the easiest way for me to Fantastic. get that forward. Yep. We'll make sure that you're able to share. Thank you. Imagine if we had an insider or a spotlight on it. Well, Chavez. Yeah. Um, 
Again, thank you for your service, Ray. Really appreciate it. Now that you put a lot of time and energy into this and it really shows. So wanna appreciate that. Um, and I also really appreciate it, you um, highlighting two big projects that make us really proud here in Eastside. I mean, I think um, <clears throat> this, this department does such an amazing job um, at you know, making sure we have beautiful buildings and, um, and such and, and two, two big projects that I think Eastside stands out for. One is the student union at YB, right? Which our very own Tom Wynn um, had a big role <laughs> with Mr. Lucas in, in making sure that that is state of the art. So I just wanna acknowledge these two gentlemen here um, who, who led a lot of that um, <clears throat> and Eastside access too, right? As, you know, we we figure out what you know um, schooling is going to continue to look look like and get through you know move forward from this past year of having been completely online pretty much. Um, it was what really supported us in moving forward. And you know, to your point, we are sharing, and that's why people are like, "Well, Eastside, what, what's happening? What you're doing over there?" Um, Glenn has probably been receiving a lot of outreach about that, so. Um, yeah, thank you for highlighting that. That's uh, our taxpayer money being put to, to good use. Um, so, Thank you for your service. I appreciate the message you brought forth today. Uh, that not one, that we are in compliance, that we do what we're supposed to be doing. And also your message, I appreciate your message about increasing diversity as well as reaching out to our student body so let them know um, how this program, this uh, the bond program, how to affect them at the moment and how it will affect them in the futures when they are taxpayer. So thank you for that. I also glad that I finally get to see you in person. So I think all these time <laughs> all over Zoom so and, uh, and uh, Facebook. So I appreciate it. we meet in person. Thank you for coming here today. All right. Um, we just to accept to receive the citizen bond oversight committee today, right? We, we move, don't have to move to approve. Vote. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. The item I 8.02 passed unanimously, no abstention. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Muller. I also want to thank the bond program. Thanks for your great work. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for staff, Mr. Lucas and every staff has been worked very hard for those uh, citizen bond or the site committee. And I do see one member of the, the committee, uh, Patrick Trainer, is one of the, he's, he's in, uh, watching or one of our attendees oh, really? here. So thank you, Patrick, as well for your service. All right. And all the members of the committee. Awesome. I thank did you. want to mention once more, um, this isn't done by any one of us. Um, this report was in fact done by myself, um, my co our vice chair, uh, Melissa Gott Lopez, who did a national night out event last night that was so overwhelming that she was exhausted. And so she's at home. Um, and also um, Christopher, who is a new member, <laughs> was our third member of our committee whose last name fails me and I'm sorry, Christopher. Um, but there were three of us that put the report together, presented it to our committee and then the, that committee decided whether it was okay to put it forth to you. So um, we do work as a group. So there's no one of us. And I do want to make sure that we acknowledge that the committee did the work. So thank you to the committee. Thank you. All right. All right, we move to 8.03, discussion and action to ratify approved school field trips. Ms. Teresa Marcus, Associate Superintendent of Educational Services. Please take it over. Thank you. Good evening, Madam President, Board of Trustees. Um, I bring this item to you at uh, special order of business. Normally this is an item that would be part of consent, uh, but I bring it to you given that as we prepare to return to in-person instruction, and as we prepare to look at the safety protocols, um, given the um, existing pandemic, I wanted to provide an opportunity for the board to discuss um, the uh, possible actions that we should be taking as more field trips are going to be coming forward um, to you. Uh, currently, we only do have the one, which is a volleyball uh, tournament college visit for the volleyball uh, program at Andrew Hill High School. Uh, but again, wanted to take it at a special order of business to allow you to have some discussion about what your um, intent are and what your actions or direction is in terms of us bringing forth other field trips that will be coming once we return to in-person instruction. 
Thank you. Uh, Theresa Marcus, do you have to go ahead, uh, board member? Yeah, Patisi? thank you. So um, I know that we've had sports for some time, and even though the, they, the travel isn't largely out of the district or the county, at least, we must have some protocols, have established some protocols for transporting students and like that. And I'm, I'm assuming that if when we start to talk about field trips, we're going to be, we have created some protocols for, and now this is a trip to San Diego. So there's, you know, overnight stays and um, have we factored in how that, you know, I think in the past we've had probably students sharing rooms. And so I don't know how that, has that changed or what, what are we doing uh, as we open up to field trips, how it has our protocols around that been influenced by COVID? <clears throat> Yes, yeah, so currently we, just like we are gonna begin to transport and we were actually transporting students at bus for our summer school, in particular our um, Matu Subia programs, we followed all the protocols in terms of the spacing, the limitations, the masking. Um, and so that will continue to be um, in place. Um, currently, we would follow the guidelines that are in existence, which is masking. Um, there is no physical distancing requirements. Um, at the time, so we would continue to, to follow those specific um, requirements. So that would be the same in terms of um, travel, right? If, if it's a, um, in this case, it's a personal vehicle. So, <clears throat> you know, students would have to be masked up for that entire trip um, in terms of the sharing of the room. It's the protocols and the expectations of also the hotel, <clears throat> excuse me, the hotel rooms in terms of what they're allowing in terms of, of capacity and space and ensuring that the students are um, wearing the mask and following those protocols. But I know that as a team, we're working on expanding those safety protocols for these circumstances, but I wanted to make sure that the board um, at least had it on your radar that there will be some more field trips um, requests that will be coming. Um, and as the guidelines for public health shift or not, we will adhere to those guidelines, but just wanting to make sure that um, you're going to have, um, you know, field trips coming for your approval that are overnight, potentially out of California, um, and looking at um, our level of approval for that based on certain circumstances that are in existence with public health guidelines. I have a, qu I have a question that all students that who uh, will take the trip uh, to call the tournament, do they, all of them have to be vaccinated or what is the requirement for in terms of you know safety for others? Yeah, currently we are not mandating students to be vaccinated and because it is a school sponsored um, event and it's part of the um, athletic program um, and superintendent can chime in and, and acting super, associate superintendent Wynn can also chime in on this. Um, we are not currently requiring students to be um, vaccinated. Did the parent have to sign the um, kind of like a, um, an agreement, uh, yeah, from, from the school that they will take the responsibility, correct? Because yeah, we, we have to protect the liability mm -hmm. from our school as well as uh, from the parents' standpoint of view. Yeah, so we currently do have our regular field trip forms that obviously students would have to um, complete and submit. There's that uh, documentation that already exists even pre-COVID. Um, but I know my, my colleague, uh, Mr. Wynn, is um, also working on uh, consents and, and uh, various uh, forms to be able to issue to our families um, that uh, would give their consent and certain authorizations for whether it be a testing um, and ensuring that we're able to track should a kid be uh, found to be uh, positive with, with COVID. Thank you, Ms. Teresa Marcus. Any other board member has a question? Is there any plan to require um, vaccination for students that, are, that can take the vaccinations or at that's any point? Mandating the vaccination for our students? Right, it's for those who get to go on these field trips as the, as the requirement, is there any plan of that? Not currently, um, in particular, if it is part of their educational program and it's something that we have open access, um, I think that we would definitely have to go into discussion as if it's a field trip that is not necessarily part of their um, foundational educational instructional program, um, which we know that there sometimes are various um, opportunities for students. But I think currently, if it is part of their 
um, school offering, part of their educational instructional program that is accessible to, to students such as athletics, um, or it's part of a club that is school sponsored. We are currently not requiring vaccinations. Thank you. What, what does public health say with field trips? Do they have anything like nada? No, unfortunately, there's um, not very much out there in terms of the field trips and, and extra uh, curriculars that extend beyond athletics. I think the, the closest that they come is athletics, some guidance around athletics, but um, they're pretty quiet, um, unless my colleagues have know something different about field trips. Tom? They, they are very quiet. Um, and for athletics, it's mask indoors, even during competition. Uh, but currently for outdoor uh, athletic participation, it's no masks that's required. Uh, for a trip like this, when we develop and, and, and communicate back to the school, I would think that uh, perhaps a few days before they embark on the trip, that we have these students get tested um, to see, you know, if to make sure they're, they're uh, you know, negative before they head out on, on the trip. But we'll definitely communicate to the school uh, in regards to this. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I think that should be a thing that everyone should get tested prior to going on the field trip. Um, and I think we just got to stay very close to what public health says, because especially as we come back, we got to make sure that we, we have everything under control, right? And that our students stay as healthy as possible. I think part of health is having opportunities like this too, though, right? And so it's just finding a balance of taking the precautions, following public health, doing what we can, while keeping a close eye and making sure that our students have access to as many of these things as possible. Vote for approval, Madam President. I have one, I have one more question. Um, do, do the, so the field trips right now, we're just talking about San Diego, which, you know, but uh, as they expand, the request to expand could even include out of the country, right? Potentially, so yes. Is there some consideration for, you know, the, the surge rates in other countries, you know, especially with regard, we had an issue before with students paying large deposits, and then not being able to get those back and, you know, and do we want to even support, you know, students going to countries where, you know, I, I mean, it, it's, this is not over yet, right? Absolutely. So, and the Delta variant and whatever, I don't want to be fear-based. I think we want to get our students out and, and, you know, seeing the world again, experience things, but I also don't, I want to learn from the lessons of the last, you know, 18 months. So. What are your thoughts about that? And that's precisely why we brought this for you tonight to, to bring this specific scenario to you, let you know that there are very little guidelines as it relates to this. And so bring this for your approval now, um, understanding that if guidelines change and causes us to postpone or cancel these type of events, we will work with the guidelines um, and we'll continue to work with our reopening task force around uh, if, and continue in terms of if we'll bring tighter restrictions on certain areas. Uh, that are outside of the guidelines right now. So as we know, there's no guideline right to, uh, to um, in, ensure or enforce that all students are vaccinated. Um, even testing is optional with right now within the guidelines. So we'll continue to work with the reopening task force and bring those kind of changes to make sure that we're providing the safe conditions. And as it relates to field trips this year, whether they're local or they extend beyond the, the 60 miles or out of state, we'll bring these uh, to you for exactly kind of that, where the data is, where the guidelines are and why we would recommend some for approval and perhaps others not. Lynn, did you just say that testing is part of the guidelines? I just wanna be clear. No, right now testing is not necessarily, there's no guideline that says that um, students must be tested. Um, as you'll see later in our reopening task force that we're testing will be optional, but we are allowed as, as a district to read the data and respond and in certain cases have a more restrictive, if that's, if that's the word, program, but we would want to bring that to you formally as a presentation before, uh, my, to oh, move to that. Okay, my request would be that our students for this field trip get tested before going on the field trip. We'll work with the, the members on this uh, for this particular trip um, and look perhaps for a more formalized statement across the board at our next meeting. Thank you. Do we have a second? Uh, well, we don't have second. We'll second. second. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Silent pause unanimously. 
uh, no abstention. So let's we move on to 9.01. We will now hold a public hearing, which is scheduled at 7.01. Proposed amendment to board policy 6158, independent study, education code section 51747, and 5 CCR section 11701. Calling for public speaker. Speaker of the second time. There is no written public comment on this item. Oh, time. Okay. Public testimony in this matter is now closed. Now we move to 9.02 discussion and action waive second reading requirement of law by law 9310 and approve proposed amendments to board policy 6518 independent study. Mr. Glenn Vanderzee, superintendent, and Ms. Teresa Marcus, associate superintendent of educational services. Please take it over. So as you will hear later in our reopening uh, presentation, that independent studies program was a, a late addition by the state uh, in, in, in a reopening for the fall. And in, 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 in issuing uh, ISP as an option or independent studies program as an option for districts, the, some of the rules regarding the program also changed. And so uh, we're obligated to um, change some of the, the, the board policies to align to that. And I think uh, Associate Superintendent Marquez is, and her team has done excellent work and kind of highlight just a few of those changes and just kind of, and all, as well as kind of the timeline for uh, this policy, as we know it is for 21-22. Thank you, Mr. Vanderzee. So as a result of the Assembly Bill 130 that um, was approved for the state of California, independent studies um, did and now does now have some new requirements. One of the requirements is to one, hold a public hearing, which we have just done, and two is to amend existing independent studies policies to be in compliance with the new requirements. So what you'll notice in the board policy is that um, one of the new requirements is that we include as part of the policy, what we deem to be a level of satisfactory educational progress, which would include the number of missed assignments that would be allowed before an evaluation of that student is conducted to be able to determine if it is truly in the best interest of that student to remain in independent study. And we also have to include a written record of those findings in any evaluation. That is a new requirement that we need to make sure that is part of our board policy. Another new requirement is to actually pinpoint the additional um, educational indicators, progress indicators of that student that you will see in our, um, that we're working on our amended um, administrative regulation as that is more specific to the um, inner workings of the independent studies. Um, additionally, um, as part of the uh, change in policy, another major requirement is the qualification for independent studies, which what has been added is the opportunity for students whose parents feel their health will be put at risk by in-person instruction, that now becomes one of the rationales for being able to take on independent studies. Um, and so those are some of the major changes within the board policy. In addition, there's changes to the actual written agreement, which is what we call our master agreement that di dictates the level of coursework um, that the student will take through independent studies, as well as the timelines and the added tiered re-engagement supports that we must put in place should we see that a student is not making satisfactory progress through independent studies. And additionally, another change that's been brought into as part of the policy is that we, as a high school district, must ensure that we offer substantially equivalent coursework within independent studies, which includes our A through G courses um, and any other courses that would be made available to students so that they can meet not only their graduation requirements, but their A through G requirements. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the complexity of this um, from our wonderful legislature. Um, so the first thing I noticed is that this is a board policy that for 21-22, the district shall, 
And then for subsequent years, the district may. So um, does that mean we, we have to revisit this after this year? Is that? Yes. yes? Okay. Yeah, AB 130 specifically states that this is for uh, school year 2021-22 only, and we will definitely have to revisit it for the upcoming school years. Okay, so um, my, my other um, concern is that um, in several places it says for the 21-22 school year, um, the district shall obtain a signed written agreement for independent study no later than 30 days after the first day of instruction, which could be really problematic for people, say a student gets exposed to COVID and their parent wants to take them, put them into independent studies. I, I mean, what, do we tell them it's too late? What, what? No, so the assembly bill allows for enrollment, disenrollment, enrollment um, as by the parent. Um, what the assembly bill has um, allowed for is for parents to be able to elect to enroll in independent studies should it not work out for whatever reason, um, even per their own request, they're um, able to request a withdrawal from independent studies and return to in-person. And we must abide by that within five instructional okay. days. Mm -hmm. And so um, the written agreement itself, um, I think the 30 days are in place because the bill came out so late that they want us to make sure that those initial requests that have come in, that we have sufficient time to be able to meet with our families, review the options of ISP, get their counselors to review their coursework, put in place the coursework, sign the agreement so that then they can make sure to um, begin their coursework um, both asynchronously and synchronously. But we uh, have to remain open throughout the school year to allow for in and out of independent studies. So why, the, I'm not sure I understand why this language then? Yeah, that's part of, of just the, I believe the legislation's attempt to ensure that we're able to have as many of our requests met as soon as possible within the start of the school year. However, to your point, um, uh, Board Trustee. Oh, uh, we I see. this is for us to respond to those requests. Yes, to it's sign. not that the students have to apply. No, 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 no. And it's for us to be able to have a master signed got agreement it, it, it. that clearly indicates the level of coursework the student's gonna be taking. Normally um, through ISP, um, the turnaround is fairly quick. The, the kids get submitted, um, but again, it's a very small number of students that um, enter into independent studies. With the expansion of this, the, they're allowing us a little bit of cushion to be able to put in place all the requirements so that we're able to then have that written agreement. But it doesn't mean that parents only have the 30 days to submit their requests. They have actually throughout the entire school year. Okay, that makes sense. We're a rather large district and have already a rather robust independent studies program. Uh, part of the learning for many districts right now, uh, many don't or very small programs. And so this, I think the language there is for some districts to be able have the time to build, but also Scale the up. urgency got to it. say build up, but there is a there is you got to get it done. Timeline. Okay, good. My other question was, um, there's, what's the difference between independent study program and course based independent study? Because there's a whole other section on that. And I was pretty confused as to what the difference is. Yeah, our, we, we run a, a traditional independent studies program, meaning that the students um, take a variety of different courses that are equivalent to what they would normally take if they were in, in person. The course base is more specific to an area of study where if we had um, a student that specifically wanted to focus on in the area of social studies. Um, and so we would be able to provide for them if we had a course based independent studies, which we don't. We have the traditional independent studies. Uh, an array of courses that would focus on specifically that co those courses or that subject area for that student. Okay, so this section on course-based independent independent study does just doesn't really apply. It to does us. not apply to us. We we are okay. following the traditional so this is independent just studies. CSBA template language, Correct. and it doesn't it doesn't apply to us. Okay, Correct. So, um, okay, so just uh, I have to have my grammarian hat on. Sorry, but um, section. Oh, 
I know you pull this, just page nine, section six, there should be a space between students and who. That's all. Thank you for the clarification. Absolutely. I have some clarifying questions. Um, one, well, before I go there, I just want to say I really appreciate the thoroughness of the stuff. Um, and I appreciate also the, the parent piece or guardian piece where we engage with the family to make sure that they understand what does this mean? I think that's, that's super important for them to understand, and, you know, just be clear on expectations and then make the final decision that makes no sense for them and their family. Um, my clarifying questions are, I, I couldn't quite figure out whether students get a grade or satisfaction. Um, yeah, can, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so our students are still issued grades um, for each of the courses that they complete through independent studies. Um, the, uh, the requirement of demonstrated demonstrating satisfactory level of progress um, is for us to ensure that our students are finding success through independent studies, which could be measured through uh, grades um, and with their, their uh, work submission, completion, the evaluation of their actual work by the teachers of record, their attendance to their synchronous um, interactions with their teachers. Um, and so they actually still are issued grades for the courses that they're taking through independent studies. Got it, okay, um, okay. And so the satisfaction piece is gonna be pretty much given by their teacher who supports their overall program because there's gonna be like a master teacher, if you will, that's your go-to aside from your subject area experts, right? So the way independent works for uh, independent studies works for us is that one, because the majority of the work is done independently, it's done um, asynchronously, um, they, a teacher of record um, provides their support in all the courses that they're taking. And so if I'm a, a 11th grader taking US history, English three, um, math three, then my teacher of record is supporting me in each of those um, areas uh, as needed when we meet for our synchronous uh, time. Um, and do all of our students have access to this? I wasn't too clear whether special education students with special needs have access to this as well. So the short answer is yes, they do. However, um, as part of the um, assembly bill and actually even pre um, AB 130 independent studies, ed code was very clear that um, independent studies is not necessarily our offer of FAPE, uh, free appropriate education for our, our students. Um, however, we have to have an actual IEP meeting so that the team determines what the appropriate placement is for students. And if um, only through the IEP meeting is it determined that um, the appropriate placement for providing the maximum educational benefit for the student with a disability is through independent studies, then we will move forward um, with that. However, um, an IEP meeting does have to happen um, for that determination to be made for students to be able to um, be enrolled in independent studies. Well, we've been making sure that there are systems in place to ensure that our students don't have to wait months for the IEP meeting to happen. Yeah, uh, part of the process is I've put in timelines um, and we're actually, we're mandated with timelines as well for this to be able to happen, just given not only the regulations and the compliance with the IEP, but also with this new um, assembly bill. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, so, uh, so when parents decide to keep the student at home, then, and they change their mind, they have five days to bring the kid back or after five days, they don't have uh, an option. Can you clarify that? For Absolutely, me? no, the timeline is for us. Um, what the assembly bill intends to do is to ensure that to board uh, trustees, Chavez point, we are not keeping uh, parents um, in limbo uh, for too long, um, that we are actually acting swiftly and making sure that once that parent makes the request 
to return to in person that we are um, expediting that request and that we're able to do it within the five uh, days so that the student does not lose um, any further instruction uh, during that wait time that they're able to return fully to in person. And so that's a timeline that is set for us to make sure that we respond in a timely manner to our families. Um, it does not mean that they're giving up their option. Um, either way, actually, they can return to in person. And then if they find that that's not working, they're actually able to request to return to independent studies. Well, but what happened, um, and I, I, I can think that it's going to be a lot of works for administrator, teachers, and staff uh, when school reopen on August 10, because, you know, parents might feel in different ways. Mm -hmm. They might have changed their mind, or whatever, you know, the decision that uh, they make, they're just going to have to respect the decision. But I'm just uh, feel the pressure right now yes. from you know <laughs> administrators as staff and teachers going to have to balance you know their work schedule and accommodate you know with the parents the decision right yes absolutely and that is you know part of the the, the pressure you've said it um, absolutely correctly um, madam president in that the legislation came so late in the summer um, you know especially for us that we start next week um, that, yeah, we have our school sites working very diligently um, on making sure that they're making contact. They've already started. Our school counselors have been working um, already. Um, they've, they've come in, to, you know, during their summertime to come in and begin to make those phone calls, to begin to make those meet, uh, meet with the parents um, so that our parents are very much well aware what specifically um, ISP is so that they make a well-informed decision and choice that is going to be a best educational benefit um, for their student. And so our school counselors are already working um, and they will continue to work as the um, requests continue to, to come in. Yeah. And one more question that I have in mind that uh, I appreciate the independent study, but I know that would not have enough uh, support for the student that going to take independent study because they're going to meet with teacher uh, said that one hour per week correct um, are we going to have some kind of support some kind of program if the student uh, probably could not catch up with the class with the classmate because you know not every child has the same foundation same you know education background but the, because the safety, you know, uh, and the parent decide for the student. So how are we going to support, you know, the student probably will not catch up until the end of semester and we're gonna fail them. So I feel that are we going to have any other program to support them, you know, after we find out maybe after, uh, you know, a month or, you know, six weeks that the, the student could not catch up with all of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, tests or, or they fell or a quiz. Uh, so are we going to do something with that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer this in, in two ways. The first way is that for our independent studies program, one of the new requirements actually is to make sure that we have interventions and supports for the students in independent studies. Um, and so uh, just like they did before, even pre AB 130, our students in independent study still have access to those services at their home school. Um, they, we can still make a referral to them to, um, for mental health and wellness. And so they still have complete access to our social workers, our mental um, health and wellness specialists. They still continue to have access to their academic counselors um, for course planning. Um, and so they continue to, be, to have access um, and it is our obligation to continue to provide those services um, through their, their home school. Um, we recognize, um, having said that, I want to make sure that, that our board and our community knows that for us, ASI, we strongly believe that the optimal approach to prepare our students for college and career readiness is in-person instruction. I just want to put that out there. Um, and although, yes, we have an independent studies program that is available for students whose health may be put at risk, because of the situation that we're in, um, I do also wanna make sure that we have an obligation to provide services to those students as well. And that obligation includes um, the coursework that is both A through G aligned um, and um, rigorous as they would be receiving in their um, regular classroom. 
and that we also need to make sure that we provide services for those students um, whose health would truly uh, be placed um, at risk if they were to return um, for in-person. The other piece of it is yes, for those students that um, maybe it's a temporary health um, condition, it could be a social emotional or mental health issue that they um, try independent studies and they feel that, you know what, um, getting back into the schooling situation, um, I feel comfortable, I'm ready to return to in-person. Um, we need to make sure that we also put in place interventions as they transition back into in-person. I think that was one of the biggest rationales for making sure that we return them um, very swiftly within those five days so that they, they're able to uh, re-engage with their classmates. Because in independent studies, we have to provide a substantially equivalent level of coursework, meaning that the English one work that a student does through independent studies in terms of the skill development is um, equivalent to that skill development or substantially equivalent to that skill uh, development that they would get in their English course. We anticipate that that transition because of how we've created the course contracts in terms of academics um, will be easier. However, knowing that, we also understand that we'll have to put in place interventions such as tutoring support. Um, you, you saw, I believe it was at the July board meeting where you approved the contract for tutoring services across the district that are on demand. So we'll be able to provide that. We're planning to provide more Saturday and intercession, meaning during the break, many learning sessions as we did this summer to ensure that students are able to receive the support that they need. Additionally, one of the things that we've asked our principals to do and that we're gonna be messaging out is that as we return to in-person instruction, the first two to three weeks of school do not have to be content. And so if we take those first two to three weeks and not focus on math formulas, or English essays or um, conjugating verbs in our world language courses, but instead really work to rebuild our relationships, to re-engage with our students, um, then that in itself makes it a little bit easier to also make the transition for those families that are still unsure as to what the best educational option is for their, their child. Awesome, Ms. Marcus, very uh, engagement the conversation and I think I'm learning a little bit more for independent study uh, and I know that you know I, I have to say that I appreciate administrator staff counselor you know teachers have been going to work very hard when we have reopened in school in August uh, 10 so uh, we have a motion by uh, vice president Herrera and I think second or anyone okay. second okay. Okay, so. Well, what the heck? Had a motion by uh, Vice President Herrera, second by Board Member Doe. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, item 9.02 has passed unanimously, no abstention. We're going to move to item 10 is public members who wish to address the board. 10 Point oh one member of the public may address the board on any subject not on tonight's agenda. However, provisions of the Brown Act, Government Code Section 54954.2a and 54954.3 preclude any action. As an unagendized item, no response is required from the board or district staff and no action can be taken. However, the board may instruct the superintendent to agendize agenda Persons wishing to address the board must fill out speaker request form via online submission. Your comment will be read out loud as part of public meeting. Comments should be limited to no more than 1,000 characters in length. You may also raise your virtual hands in Zoom to request to speak. You will have two minutes to speak. I don't know that we have any uh, public yeah. member. Yes. Madam President, there is no written comments. No written comments as well as no one in public want to wish address to the board. So we're going to move to 11.01 .01, presentation, information, discussion, and action regarding update on novel coronavirus, COVID 19, and school reopening. Mr. Van, uh, Glenn Van Der Zee, Superintendent, please take it over. Thank you very much. And uh... We will be visiting some items here that we've already discussed uh, by way of independent studies and field trips, but um, 
I definitely want to give the board an overview of the new data and guidelines for reopening, which we shared. Uh, we would have loved to got in May, you know, <laughs> or in April, but when we did uh, finally receive them, we were able to, uh, you know, make good on our earlier statement that we intended to open as, as full as possible, and then be able to share what the most current guidelines or restrictions, as well as other programmatic offerings. So we'll be sharing that information with you uh, this evening. And, but also uh, Eastside isn't just returning to school. I think we've talked about the fact that there's no going back to normal, right? This is a different time. And we also know that in our district, we're building equitable communities where we welcome people as they are, get to know strengths and areas for growth so we can not just respond, but we positively respond so they can engage in learning, which makes them full, our students full participants in Silicon Valley. As we talked about in our last meeting, reopening, we can't walk away from that and say our challenge is, is what, coming back with masks on. No, we are fully living up to our, our, our aim of building equitable communities and how we respond. And by doing that, we're gonna ask, we're gonna not just focus on what's the structure of the schooling, we're gonna share where, how we've made efforts in the four areas or what we're calling the four aspects of reopening so that how we reopen moves us towards our goal of building equitable communities. I do want to let you know, though, and you've heard this in the media and we're talking with others, there are some people that believe we should have never closed um, back in March of 2020. There are some people that have a certain level of anxiety in returning. And as a district, we hear, we hear, we hear both groups. We hear people in different places along the way. And therefore, we're focused on a plan that provides for maximum public safety, uh, but also um, getting our students into those these learning opportunities that they've been away from from over a year. Some of the recent recent days you've heard of Delta variants and increases and things like that and so I want to make sure that I do show some of the data that's behind like the new mask mandate that the county put up that we always all of us indoors all the time have our masks on. Um, you can see um, this this one rate this data here from Santa Clara County does show just the, the positive cases. And you can see that when we first went away from each other in March of 2020, the numbers were quite low and then they built. And then uh, we experienced uh, last December and January quite a spike and then came down. And then in recent weeks, we have seen an increase again with this other, this other variant. And um, you know, you, depending on your, uh, the, where you're getting your information or uh, the information involved what our county is tracking is that they are seeing a rise. And what, um, once again, our recommendation is, uh, their recommendations in this is to vaccinate and let's wear masks. Uh, and so a lot of the guidelines that you see coming out of that are, are emanating from that data set along with this data set. And this shows until pretty recently, our current level of vaccination as a county and as a county, we are uh, we are much more vaccinated than other areas in the state, and also in the and also in the country. And that's why uh, our mandates right now, as we talked about earlier, mask wearing is required. Yet testing right now is not an absolute requirement. We do verify the or authenticate the vaccination of our adult staff, um, and then ask that there be testing. Uh, if, if not vaccinated. But you can see the vaccination rates right now of ages of residents, 12 years and older, so nearly 80%, 78.2. And then we see red percent of residents with ages with at least one dose that has passed the 84.3, and we would continue to encourage uh, those folks to get that second dose and uh, join the ranks of the vaccinated. With both the, the Delta variant and the vaccination numbers in mind, the state, or the, excuse me, Santa Clara County, uh, on the on the second two days ago, instituted a new, uh, instituted a new order uh, requiring face coverings indoors. I will tell you that our letter that went out to our community and staff the week prior already asked that we made that our uh, our our stance, not just when students are present, but indoors um, that we were going to mask up. So there, from what our public has received from the district and this new mandate, there is no change that's required in their behavior. 
Uh, again, this I just want to be really clear on this. Our decision to reopen it has is in a, is in response to the state saying we are funding and expecting full reopening, and that distance learning as we knew it in the past is no longer an option. So the new guidelines really center around the fact that um, around mask wearing, and so the guidelines require that we will be wearing masks indoors. Um, and that's whether it's a during the day activity or an after school or extracurricular activity. If it's a school related event, we mask up when indoors. Um, that's the second bullet point there. There are exemptions, right? So you can qualify for an exemption from wearing a mask if you have a medical condition. Um, we have students that read lips um, in, 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 in an instructional environment. And so when we do know that there is a need for instructionally or as a learner, for a face shield in lieu of a mask, then we will make those adjustments and uh, accommodations for folks. And then there's also some situations where, where and how people work a lot in our facilities and maintenance that sometimes a mask is an actual liability in terms of the tools you're using or where you're working and where that's a scenario uh, folks can apply for an exemption. And so that's already been communicated to our staff and to our site. We've received very few uh, requests for that but it is uh, an option for folks during this moment. Um, the, disc will, uh, the district will provide a mask for any staff and student who doesn't have one. Uh, we issued masks early in the year. Uh, we are purchasing another 450,000 masks um, as, as we enter into this school year and in order to be prepared. This is straight from the guidelines. So, uh, please excuse the length, but essentially what, what I just referred to is that there might be a situation where teacher uh, might need to wear a face shield in order for instructional purposes with a student. But when that instructional purpose is changed and we're working with a different set of students, then they should return to the school. Masks are currently are not required when students and employees are outdoors, um, but it's optional. So that's something that's open to people. And we know, I think we've learned, all learned that these situations are fluid and that the guidelines change. And so I can't help but say right now, <laughs> when I say that right now it's, it's for indoors only and not outdoors. So uh, part of this presentation and part of what we just talked about with field trips is that we will adjust, right? And same thing with our independent study uh, program, but we will make the necessary adjustments to meet our community where it is and still work forward, make the positive response so that they can, participate as fully as possible. Of course, as part of this, the guidelines that um, hand sanitizer is available and um, the guidelines and the recommendations have moved away from cleaning your surface every time you leave. The whole notion of the contact transmission has reduced greatly and there's a de-emphasis in that, um, but we still will make hand sanitizer available. Um, and for some folk, um, Part of staying well and focused in this last year and a half, some of us have just learned that hand sanitizer feels like something that's comforting and, and allows us not only to stay healthy, but also to just stay mindful and present in the moment and to feel safe. So we will have that equipment and, uh, excuse me, that PPE and that practice of daily cleaning in place. And I see everybody reaching for their hand sanitizer right now. So I guess, <laughs> I, I guess it, is, it, is a, it is a 2021 trigger, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's really as just in terms of reopening, just kind of the simple fact we're back open, there's no distance learning, and we're going to welcome each other back and um, the, all the benefits of interpersonal interaction and live instruction, and we're asking that mask stay on. Um, our schools and our in our professional development, and when we were interviewed uh, by uh, San Jose uh, Spotlight the other day, it's just like, you know, what, how are people going to respond to wearing masks all the time? And it's just, hey, that's one advantage of being a high school district. We do change classes. So there will be that moment to step outside, take the mask off, go back in. But we're also understanding that our students and our and teachers are in block schedules. And so a lot of us are just saying, we're going we're gonna to read the situation. If you see someone struggling with the mask and they need a minute outside, let's, let's grant that. If you as a group with a 90-minute class say, we're doing good work. Let's go outside, do a quick summary review what we've been talking about, mask off for a little bit and come back in. Those are all ways that we're, we're gonna make this work, right? Uh, as a group and encouraging just students and adults to, to work together uh, in getting through this. 
as Associate Superintendent Marquez just expertly walked all of you through and, and to, to your, uh, your questions, there is also a new guide for reopening is the independent studies program. And it, it will be offered in 21-22. Um, there's synchronous instruction and for the, the district, I wanna be really clear and say it again that uh, this synchronous instruction for Eastside is the one hour that week, but it's independent studies. It, it really is that first word of independent. And so while there are supports and there are mechanisms to, um, to assist students in getting through this, families that make this, make this decision do need to understand that it is um, independent studies uh, appropriately named. So they do have, we, we have had the right to independent studies that's gone out, it's been communicated, it's on our webpage, the links are live, the applications have been translated um, into Spanish, uh, they're available in English, Spanish and Vietnamese. Um, and we are already beginning the process of meeting with families and letting them know what, what the program is, onboarding them, and then there is a process of meeting with counselors uh, to confirm that, and then also to start seeing what the appropriate schedule would be for that person if they were to formulate into the independent studies program. So those really are the guidelines that said, Eastside, thou shalt, right? And this is what you'll do this uh, for this year. That's, that's what the guidelines call for. As I mentioned earlier, as we pursue our, 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 our goal of building equitable communities, we're focusing on four aspects of return. Of return. What the state has really um, issued us is, hey, establish a learning environment, reopen, have independent study. Um, but we, we, we are reopening task force and our team um, has zeroed in on safety, wellness, the structure, and then credit and learning loss. How are we gonna to adjust to the fact um, that we had more Fs last year than in previous year um, and that our students are gonna to have to recover credits going forward? So as it relates to safety, as I mentioned earlier, each site has a supply of masks and we'll pride them upon request. Uh, we asked uh, business services to get the, those out um, by Thursday. I guess they heard when the board meeting moved up to Wednesday that that deadline uh, moved up too. And I've been told that the PPE was delivered today. Um, the district will provide the hand sanitizer, the dust shields, the drape, uh, dust shields and drape shields and other PPE supplies as requested. Um, the vaccination authentic authentication and testing program is also in place. So we have an MOU in place with um, our teachers agreement. And I really wanna give um, Estelle a lot of credit in that we established an MOU with them in the spring, uh, really zeroing in on uh, verifying who is vaccinated. And if not, that we will be asking for testing. Um, and I know that um, our, our good partners in CSCA will be uh, voting on Tuesday because they wanna make sure that all their membership has, is back and has a chance to look at that agreement. And they'll be uh, voting as to whether to ratify uh, on Tuesday, a similar language um, on, in terms of authentication and testing. Now, we will um, continue to work with our reopening task force and monitor the guidelines as to whether we do a more restrictive form of testing uh, for both adults and or students, but there will be optional testing even for vaccinated staff. If a vaccinated staff member wants to test, they are, we will make that available. Uh, if students want to test, that will also be available at this point. And like I say, we will continue to monitor both the guidelines and our internal data as to whether or not we move to a more uh, universal or <laughs> in the phrase of guidelines, more restrictive form of testing in the future. Um, we are currently, there are different agencies within the state that are making free testing available. We are in cooperation with them already and we'll be uh, moving forward with that. Um, quick question. Yeah. During the um, school reopening task force meeting, one of the student participants said that another district had posted like a dashboard, COVID dashboard on their website yeah. to, that is that something we could do? I thought it was a good idea. Yeah, I think very it much might so. give parents some comfort knowing like, hey, there's not actually even been any cases. You yeah, know? I mean, that's the beautiful you know? thing. And yeah. I, I gotta tell you, we've been uh, quite, uh, get quite the, the place of interest from uh, various news groups and that we held a summer school uh, and that it was in person and that there were zero incidences of transmission. 
Um, just saying that if when we have the safety, the, the, the safeguards in place, we follow them, we take it seriously. Um, and I think we've found in our buildings that students really reinforce them with each other <laughs> in terms of the protective measures as opposed to the opposite. So um, yes, absolutely. Um, good things. And so the other option that I want to move to is just that we will have templates or there's templates for responses. So there's with now having vaccinated and unvaccinated portions of the population, um, it used to be that there were one set of rules if, if you were symptomatic or if you came in contact with somebody who was positive. Uh, there are now kind of two different sets of rules for whether you're vaccinated or not, if you're symptomatic or not. And so I want to uh, thank, um, so, uh, I think Associate Superintendent Tom Wynn and uh, Mike Doe, who's been doing a lot of work in HR uh, for putting together the templates. For, for staff and for our community to know this is how we'll respond um, in terms of if you're in contact, if you're symptomatic, here's, here's when you should stay home, here's when you might be asked to stay home, and then what the rules are for returning so that, we, that our people are clear on that. So as soon as they're ready to return, that we're all, uh, we get students back in the class as soon as possible. When we talk about going back to normal, right? Like the old days when you when you go say, I need to go to the office because I, sne I sneezed. You know, we all feel differently about a sneeze now, right? Uh, and so there's protocols in place for that and really looking to also get the uh, more uh, rapid testing um, that might allow us if somebody comes to the office to be able to get a positive or negative result in 30 minutes uh, to see whether we can keep them keep them in school because that's our goal right is to keep ourselves safe but also can continue to provide that, provide that education the other thing i think is super important and i want to thank uh, business services and i want to thank uh, facilities as well is early on they looked to, to both acquire and install those cdc recommended um, merv 13 filters in our hvac systems heating uh, ventilation air conditioning systems to make sure that the air we're breathing has gone through the proper proper filtration. So that's where we are with safety and how we've prepared. That's, that's how we've made ourselves ready and feel good about opening, all right? The other thing that the second aspect of return that we talked about is, is wellness. Maybe you're gonna to get to it, but um, uh, I'm just concerned that there be some clarity in the public regarding that independent study is not the remote learning that was available during the pandemic. Uh, and it seems like rather than have people somehow figure it out by themselves that it ought to, we ought to be leading with that kind of a message. Uh, the remote learning available to pan during the pandemic is no longer available. So if they're gonna pull their child, they won't have that option, you know, and it'll have to be independent study um, as one thing. The other one is um, what, how are we anticipating um, working with kids who don't comply with the masking or become problematic or uh, regarding the masking requirement? Yeah, so let's, let's address the first one. Yes, that thinking and the understanding that this is not distance learning as you knew it from last year. It's been key in our communications. It's key on the forms that uh, people are filling out. It's central to that first interview with the counselor just be very clear, this, this, is, this is the option um, and what that really is and how it is different than what they've experienced before is not something that comes at the end or middle um, of the conversation. It starts at the start of the conversation, it's in the middle and it, it becomes the end that the person has chosen. So a communication has gone out already to all of our families yes. by email, robocall, text, whatever. Yes. Secondly, uh, to the other point of your, your the question is there are uh, for students that don't mask, um, there are multiple rationales to why that could be. This could be in the last year and a half a trigger for somebody. This could there could be a, a health reason. Um, this, it could be related particularly to uh, a disability or, or something else or just outright refusal to wear a mask. Um, we'll, we'll go through stages to find the appropriate response true to our UBR, our uniform behavior response, true to how we say our equitable communities of finding a way to get to know what it is and positively respond for full participation. If there will be instances of people forgetting to put it on, we'll be reminding. There'll be instances of somebody 
oops, it's under my nose and we'll deal with that. But if we get to see that there is uh, someone that is just consistently not being wear, wearing a mask after direction, first would be to offer a mask for sure. Second would be to uh, educate regarding just these are the guidelines and the norms. Uh, third would be to engage if they're still uh, struggling with the idea of last, the third thing will be to engage either around an exemption or what's going on and respond appropriately there. After that, if there's still a refusal, then we'll contact the family uh, and just make them aware of the situation and the guidelines and the steps so far. After that, there will be an option for or an invitation for part participation in independent studies program. Uh, if that is also refused, then they will be referred to educational services so we can find the most appropriate response. Um, and we will we'll work not side by side on that, but through ed services um, so that the same thinking and approach is, a, is aligned um, to the particular issue as they present themselves uh, in those scenarios. Okay. Uh, uh, board member Verdal. Um, board member Verdal. Also, I don't know if you heard that every family who, who is considering independent study We'll have an independent meeting, individual meeting, like a one-on-one -on -one, to really understand what that means, aside from the communication. So they'll be really clear on that. Um, the testing uh, that we said, it, we could find out if somebody has COVID within 30 minutes, that's at every site? We're, we're entering, those are new services that are coming to the state. So we are, we are so I wanna be real clear. We, we continue to have the testing agency that we utilized last year. Uh -huh. We're going to continue to work with them in this phase of testing staff that have not authenticated their vaccination for vaccinated staff that want to opt in, as well as for students that want uh, that option. We, we are entering into an agreement with two new partners, one for um, testing for anyone at no cost and is available to do large numbers. Um, it just there's a, a, a longer delay in terms of getting the tests out and back. Uh, and then there's a second provider that we're working with uh, to bring in those more rapid 30-minute 30 30 minutes. tests. But those really are limited in terms of number, in terms of how it functions, and the administration of giving the test um, is limited to two for, uh, at, at a time. So you, it's not for mass use. It's more for very specific scenarios. Okay. But I'm so that, I, don't want to, I don't want to leave you with the impression that that's in place now and for Tuesday. Um, we do have testing in place as of Tuesday uh, where we can test and get a result back within 24 hours, but we're, we're efforting to get the two other services for the 15 to 30 minutes. Okay, great. And the last thing is, have we considered tracking students who are vaccinated? Or maybe not even like being able to identify them by name, but like having idea of how many students across the district, across school sites? So currently within just the guidelines and the asks, uh, we don't have that information available to us. That would have to be completely volunteered. Um, I'm going to assume that, well, I don't want to assume. It would not be surprising then in the coming weeks and months that the state might take um, a different approach yeah. in terms of authenticating vaccinations similar to what we're doing with our adults. Yeah. Even in the case with the adults, they do not have to turn in their actual verification of their oh. vaccination form. It is still, still a self-disclosed um, reporting that, that stands for authentication at this time. Okay. So we're going to work within those parameters for now. And once yeah. again, be hyper vigilant into changes of guidelines yeah, and then yeah. respond appropriately. Yeah, I know a lot of stuff is changing and we have a lot coming at us as we start school in a few days. I, I, I do think that's something that we should consider in the near future, thinking about how do we gauge how many of our students have vaccines through whatever means. I mean, there's a start somewhere, right? Um, especially because we're a high school district, right? And our kids overall have access to the vaccine. Hey, we're, the, we're totally in that 12 and older category, right? So we, yeah. that's, 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 a, that's truly an advantage that Eastside has yeah. in its operation and its decision-making that some other districts that are unified or K-8, uh, the tool that's really uh, not available to them. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to... Yeah, board trustee, if I may, superintendent, if I, I may, we did back uh, at the end of the school year, do an initial survey just to kind of gauge where families were in terms of their thinking for the fall return. And when we did that survey, um, we did only receive a little bit over 4,000 responses, but of those 4,000 who respond, 
Um, 67% responded that their student was fully vaccinated. Um, and there was some additional ones that were in their first dosage. So we were closer to about 70% of our students, of those respondents who were either fully vaccinated, had received one dose or had an appointment to receive their vaccination. Um, and so it's a little snapshot, but at least it gives us that initial baseline to see where we were back in the spring. I love that. That's what I'm talking about, right? Like maybe not necessarily create a system just for it, right? For that one specific answer, but to get a gauge. Um, yeah, if, if there's anything else coming out in the near future, I'd love to see where we're at. Thank you. Very good. Hey, I'd like to move us on to the second bullet point as we first started with safety and I appreciate all the comments and questions on that. And now really some in, in welcoming our students back, welcoming with a focus on wellness, uh, knowing that our students have been in very unique situations. Um, learning with siblings in, uh, in sometimes in one room. Uh, um, some of our students have found in this last year and a half new skills of like, wow, I've managed time. Or like, when I just make myself work for a couple hours and just get that done, it's done. You know, and, and learned a lot of research techniques uh, and have, have really developed that. Some of our other learners have struggled not being around their peers or have dealt with situations at home. And so we're now welcoming back uh, our learners onto campuses. And fascinating fact that our freshmen and sophomore this year never attended our high school. Like 50% of our learners, this will be their first day of high school. So our opportunity to really, when we talk about welcoming as we are, you know, and staff, get ready for my letter. This is what the letter says. We have never been given such an opportunity to re-welcome and re-norm and re-invite our learners to this. This is, the, this is the school, this is the institution, this is the building that wants you and is ready to work with you. This is our year for that. And a lot of that has, is now also dealing with the wellness and letting people know you've been through something and that's okay. And coming back might feel really uncomfortable, right? Um, but this is how we're preparing ourselves for that. So we'll have 28 social workers on staff. We added 11 for this year. Uh, we've got social workers um, for mental and wellness. We've got the availability. We'll be able to direct people very quickly to the website. Um, there are calming spaces on campuses where they can engage, get some self-directed <laughs> relaxing or deal with that anxiety and stress uh, and deal with those activities. Um, I want to thank uh, the team for putting together just a pretty comprehensive like brochure. It's a multi-page document that really outlines Here's what we mean by wellness. Here's are the services that are available to you. Here's how to access it. Here are partners that is going to be made available to everyone. Um, and, and also we're, got, we're equipped with that and with these additional bodies and this messaging. And we know we'll be working uh, tomorrow, even at four o'clock, working with our leadership of the student governing board uh, about joining us in, in publicizing and getting this word out among the student body. Um, that work is, is all in place to start the, the school year strong with this. And, you know, this is another thing about Eastside that, you know, for us that have operated in this system for so long and not maybe interacted with other districts, we have a great, great, great number and great relationships with community organizations with whom we partner. I, I, I speak with people from other districts who are straight up jealous about the resources and the partnerships that, that we have and availability for our students. Because while we're proud of those 28 and adding 11 social workers, uh, we have over 22,000 students. And you know, for us to be able to get all the services directed to those students, 28 is just not gonna cover it. So our partnerships and our referral process is key to this. And so I just want you and our community to know that as we return to school, we, 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 we reopen ready to welcome, and we, re, uh, we reopen with wellness on our mind. Part of wellness is, is, your, is health and nutrition. And one of, the, uh, one of the great opportunities that we have for this year is that we'll be able to offer free breakfast and lunch for all students. No ID, no meal application required. Now, community, it is in our best interest to fill out that application that we'll still be asking you for because it affects our future funding and ability to serve students in the future. 
It affects our, your students' ability and our students' ability to get reduced costs for AP tests and, and other things that do cost on the, as, we, as we go towards college. And so we'll be asking people to fill that form out, but we, no one's gonna be denied that breakfast or lunch uh, for not having done so. And this is um, special funding from the state for this year, is that right? And it's just for this year or this year only? Okay. So this is, as Mr. Jude just said, I just wanna make sure we get it on the recorded record is for this year, this year only. Um, and we will continue our community feeding up till Friday. And then this, the, this new program begins as we return next week. Uh, but please do notice that students that are on the independent studies program will be able to access, can access it uh, at their sites during those meal times um, that will be communicated to them. Yeah. yeah. Question. Um, I know that uh, in the coming year that we have free breakfast and lunch for our students, are we ready? Are we ready to support all of the students? Because I know when the time that I visit the site, um, most of the students at that time, that all the student that has the ID or low, um, you know, uh, low income uh, student that receive, you know, the meal, free meal. But I know now we open for everyone. I uh, was wondering how the Julie Custer uh, group and staff have to be work very hard. And are we ready with the app that one time that the student has shown us uh, so the student can uh, order the food before time? Well, because of this new funding and it is federal funding, I just wanna make sure we're clear on that. The, the federal funding that's available for us here due to the fact that it, there is no ID and no required, um, there won't be a need for punching in the pin or utilizing the app to access. Um, as far as the pre-ordering, we're gonna probably have to slow down on that for this year. And I'll just tell you why. With, where the CNS is both excited and you know, understanding that this is gonna be a challenge. Excited that we're gonna be able to offer meals to all our students. Challenged by the fact that um, we have you know, the issues of staffing and provision and just availability. And so this is where we talk about how we'll be monitoring our data. It's not just that uh, vaccination and testing data, it's looking at the data within our schools about participation uh, in, in, this, in this particular set to seeing how we have to adjust our structure and meal provision and what we provide and how uh, to, map, to make sure that our supply can meet the demand. Um, the, the bonus again though, is those lines that people used to have to wait in while somebody was trying to remember their PIN number, they no longer have to have the PIN number. So we should be able to move people faster, but we'll be moving potentially a greater number of people during the same amount of time. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. As we're looking to, uh, as you said, to uh, determine the, the proper uh, our supply meet our demand, do we have a way to determine how much of our, our uh, demand, well, so whether, uh, sorry, do we have a way to determine how much of our supplies that we have, how much excess that we have, how much is actually being um, provided to our students and how, how much we wasted? And uh, do we have any of that indicator? Yeah, uh, we, we obviously evaluate that, but I'll, I'll tell you right now, our, our, our most initial when we talk about supply and demand is that of staffing and personnel, right? So I know we, I believe we were interviewing today for, for CNS workers. Uh, it's, it might not be so much, do we, we have enough milk to distribute? It's a question of, all right, do we have enough uh, staff to be able to get those meals ready and distribute? Uh, and that's, that's also why earlier you're going to hear from, or sites, if you're listening, you're going to hear from uh, uh, the CNS department uh, looking for those student work opportunities during those times of provision, just so that we can, can uh, address those issues. But you're absolutely right. I, when it comes to the last year and a half we've been through in this next year, we, we have to keep our eye on everything. There's never one aspect where it's just, is there enough milk? There's staffing that's linked to it and guidelines and funding. So absolutely, we'll have our eye on that. All right, the established learning environment, you know, that's the one we were really thinking about a lot last April is one that now since the state declared is kind of where we have kind of the greatest number of certainty. Uh, friends, please know we'll be in full person return to classes on August 10th, 2021. Per Assembly Bill 130, we'll have an independent stu uh, stu studies program as we've already delineated. What really becomes critical now in building our equitable communities is how we address learning loss and credit decline. 
So early on, we are going to make sure our sites are planning to get the counselors ready to meet with those students, figure out where they are on their path, where they are on towards meeting graduation and age through G requirements and getting those that strategy ready and um, that students are clear. This is, this is the work I'm gonna have to do now uh, uh, in, in order to continue my growth. Uh, for class of 2022, the counselors will meet with students who may be off track and would benefit from graduating under Assembly Bill um, 104. And that's the, uh, the Assembly Bill that did talk about uh, grades uh, going from pass or fail uh, or pa um, an A through D grade going to no pass versus pass. There was also some provisions around retention uh, and graduation. And we'll be seeing uh, another uh, board policy later tonight that addresses those issues. But essentially in terms of how we operate, we have had some students already choose to graduate with the, uh, with the lower credit, the state minimum state requirements rather than our 220. Um, we have students that say, no, I want, I want that diploma that has 220 credits associated with it. And I'll either wanna come back for more time or I think I can make this work. So. Uh, we will be meeting with those students and offering that option and then creating that strategy for the graduation uh, requirements that they're going to pursue. Cyber High will continue to be an option for students needing to recover credits. As Associate Superintendent Marquez uh, referred to earlier, we're going to look at Saturdays, breaks, mini sessions for, for, for uh, students to come in work and whether address learning loss or credit recovery. One thing we should know, and this is probably going to be the most, you know, the, the part of the the this last bullet point will be the one that perhaps changes the most over the years that our response still will be through a multi-tiered systems of support. So as we look at our data, what is it that we need to do differently for students in every classroom? Right? What's, that, what's that support that has to be universal, right? Responding to unwanted behaviors as communication and responding differently to keep them in the world, in the room, that's a tier one support. Everybody needs, needs that. As we start meeting with, and we'll be looking at different strategies uh, that, will, that will address the particular learning needs of this year and addressing those tier one. And we're gonna get a lot of data from staff and students about what those are and being able to respond. And then we'll have to see where those, that tier two, where maybe about 20% or so of our learners need something a little bit more specific. And we'll always be responding through that lens, uh, through the data that comes to us and our ability to positively respond to it. That's really how our approach is going to be to addressing learning loss and credit recovery. Can I ask a question yeah. on the first bullet point? Students will meet with counselors to determine where they are with meeting A through G requirements and graduation requirements. Uh, is that happening for all students? Or how are we, or is that, is that like by site and like within the first semester? So uh, Associate Superintendent Marquez and, and Director Guerrero have been working with counselors and sites, and I'll let, the, uh, let them articulate a bit about what the approach is um, as we start the school year. Yes, yeah, so um, our counselors, actually, we started the work um, even last year with our counselors to develop those common assurance and be more aligned with the ASCA model for, for counseling. Um, and yes, that definitely is the goal, is to meet with um, every student so that they're able to have that four-year plan development and then those monitoring or benchmark checks to ensure where they are. Um, in terms of triaging and being responsive to the new requirements as per AB 104, we will be starting with our seniors um, to make sure that they are uh, um, on track and making the informed decision as to which of the um, graduation requirements is going to best uh, meet their needs. Um, and then they'll continue to work with our uh, other students to ensure that they're well aware. They've been doing that. Um, one of the work is um, developing that common assurance as to what is that meeting with ninth graders look like so that it's pretty much some common assurance at the tier one level across our sites. What does it look like for 10th graders? What does it look like for our juniors? And what does it look like for our seniors? And so our counselors, our school counselors have been working to develop those um, consistent common assurances that they can say, this is what we do when we engage with the ninth grader. These are the services that we provide, et cetera, free to the grade levels. Yeah, but when, when should we expect that? Like, will all of the kids have that within like December or? Yeah. yeah, realistically, I don't think that given the ratio of our so school counselors that we can have all our students have that, that four-year plan uh, by, 
by December. We're again, we're triaging and we're starting with our with our juniors, but the intent is for all our students to be able to see their counselors um, at least um, two times throughout the year, given that the okay. caseload for each counselor is about 435, if I remember correctly, Mr. Andersi. Yeah, the ratio is 435. Yeah, 435. And so looking at ensuring that each counselor um, within their ratio of 435, and that's that's the max is what we, we make sure. So some have a little bit less that they meet with them at least two times throughout the school year. Okay, yeah, that, that's helpful, because especially right now coming back from COVID. Every student is going to need some sort of support. Um, so I, I, you know, we meet this with, with, obviously it's, it's urgent for us because we're talking about it and we're naming it as a priority, but this is always top of mind for me, right? Whether or not we're in the pandemic or coming back from a pandemic. Um, so I was just curious. Yeah. And I think some of the challenges that we'll have to overcome is, um, when do they meet with the students, right? Because there's that argument of, do I pull them from their class? Um, and when do I have access to the students? So that's one of the things that we're working on as we look at it from a systems response lens. What do we need to put in place to ensure that our counselors have access to the students to be able to have these meetings and looking at it, do I pull them from their English class? Do I pull them from their uh, world history class? Are they losing instruction? Finding that balance and being able to come to some common assurances across our system as to um, you know, how do we prioritize these counseling services for our students so that they're able to be appropriately placed in the classroom and their classes so that then they can actually um, get the maximum out of the instruction that happens in the classroom. And so that's, you know, one of the challenges, right? You're in the classroom, you don't want your kid to be pulled out during your class. And then as a counselor, you're needing to wanting to, to meet with us. The, the last thing I'll say is that we're also looking at what are those tier one approaches that we take when it comes to school counselors that we could make sure that we put in place and that um, all students get, right? Like I said, and then which are the kids that are gonna need a little bit more, right? Which are the kids at the tier two that are gonna need those tier two interventions by counselors? What are the tier three, right? So as we look at our multi-tier system support, it's looking at it through that tiered engagement that if I pull in all my ninth graders to do a presentation for some ninth graders, that's all they need, right? Because they have, their mom, like me at home, that is in education and can navigate the system, right? But then there's those that based on their needs are gonna need a little bit more. So then how do you then put in place those interventions for the kids that need it? Thank you, thank you for that. As we return, as you can see, there's the four aspects that we just went through. And then just to name the next steps, our next step is, hey, it's next week, let's be ready. <laughs> let's get to it. And then immediately we just start looking at the data that we've been talking about, attendance data, uh, participation data. Um, what's the rates of I, uh, ISP um, uh, issues, referral rates, right? Uh, to social workers and, and good things like that. And then we just start managing our response. The other thing we'll continue to do, however, is definitely to continue with our reopen task force to talk about some of those issues, um, you know, as we start looking at, um, at, at the data and possible need for a more restrictive testing. If guidelines change, um, if we see things just to continue to get input from the various community members as we make our decisions and as we uh, continue to, like it says here, just monitor the guidelines, monitor the site data and what we're seeing across sites in order that we just positively respond. As you can see uh, illustrated already, here's our positive response to continue to adapt or the best in the best interest of our community. Will the district be offering a weekly testing? Yeah, so once again, for those, for um, staff, we have an MOU with uh, ESTA, where uh, CSA is, we'll be voting on ratification on Tuesday that if you are unable to authenticate, or we're unable to authenticate vaccination, then the testing would be required. But for all staff and all students who choose, it would like as an option, whether you're va uh, vaccinated or not, if you're vaccinated to be able to test and students with the option also, if they'd like to test, to test. Yes, so we've, we have a schedule in, in, in place and our human resources team will be issuing out um, if, uh, the schedule for uh, when testing is, when you're able to test and when pick, pickup is, and then when you would be able to anticipate if you do test positive, when you would be informed of that. 
the guidance around testing and uh, schedules and locations, uh, it's available at all sites and those were sent out last night to the administration or the administrator, excuse me. I don't know why I didn't understand the last sentence because <laughs> ran some words together there. Or I'll, no, take, the I'll the take the mask off. The, the schedules for testing and its locations, uh, which is at all sites, uh, pick up times and what you're requesting is uh, has been sent out to uh, all site administrators already last night so they're they're aware of, of that and here at the district office there's yes at every every site including the ed center and when you when we send our next letter out to staff and to the community that will be part of that informing them of when they can test and when they can anticipate uh, in being informed of a positive result so all our members of our community will be available, available the option and how to participate. So if somebody um, does not uh, want to vaccinate it, then uh, they have to be tested uh, weekly, correct? In our current uh, memorandum of understanding with our teachers union, it is if you are unable to authenticate your vaccination or you choose not to, then we do require weekly testing and that testing is made available through the district. And as I said before, CSEA, our, our valuable classified staff will be voting on that um, to ratify that MOU on Tuesday. But not, uh, you're not gonna do that for student, correct? Students testing is an option. Thank you. All right, are you done with the um, report? Yeah, I think that was a nice mix of questions and answers. And I, I think know. we have a theme running through this meeting <laughs> through, the, uh, through the, the public hearing and uh, the, the board policies. So I thank you all for your time. And um, I, I appreciate our community being mindful of each other and supportive of each other as we return to classes uh, with mandates in place, but uh, learning and being together, a real opportunity that we haven't had for a while. Right, so we need action for this item 11.01. No, this is a presentation only. A presentation only. Okay, so we move to 12.01. Discussion and action to waive second reading requirement of board bylaw 9310 and approve proposed amendments to board policy 5123 promotion and acceleration and retention and 6146.1 high school graduation requirement. Mr. Mm -hmm. Van Der Zee? I can move for approval. Is this pretty straightforward? <laughs> right, I have a question. Has a question. Oh, remember, Kathy? Yeah, so the 5123 uh, is about retention. Again, this is CSBA language, I know, and it's this comes out of AB 104, I believe, right? Yes, um, that is correct. So this language, though, about retention. Um, this is kind of unusual for us. We don't really retain kids in ninth grade, tenth grade, right? So, what? How do we? How do we? Is there anything to implement here, or is this just more of a? So you're right because we are a high school only district, and um, we issue diplomas, and we issue diplomas based on credit and not necessarily on just years of completion. Um, this is something that. Um, counter to our elementary school districts where they're probably going to have a lot more of action in this one. This is one of the AB 104 components that um, it's still inclusive of K through 11. So we do have to bring it forth as part of uh, our board policy, but I don't anticipate for too much action as you have mentioned, uh, board trustee, that we will have too many of those requests. However, we still have to make sure that we have included it and notified our families, which we have, um, because they do have a right under Assembly Bill 104 to request a retention consultation um, to determine and meet with um, site personnel if it, it is in the educational interest of the student to retain them as a ninth grader, even though credit wise is what really determines the earning of the diploma. To uh, summarize, what did we propose uh, for the amendment for the high school graduation requirement? Yeah, the, the biggest change there is the added exemption for um, these last graduating uh, seniors, class of 2021, and these new class of 2022, that they will now be 
um, allowed to take that exemption of graduating um, under the state minimum course and credit requirements as opposed to the uh, Eastside Union High School District Board adopted graduation requirements. Um, we did take advantage of uh, changing some of the outdated things as you will see they like such as the Casey. Um, we had not had an opportunity to bring that forth to the board so we did take advantage of cleaning up uh, some of those um, instances but for the most part the biggest addition is that exemption. For the school, uh, high school and graduation uh, 22, 21, 22, um, or 22, 23, they, would they require to take the um, ethnic study or not? Not yet. Okay. All right. So I know we have a motion, is but we need to do these policies separately, right? We have action. Yeah. This, this report item? No, we have to, no, we're waiving the we're second, second reading, reading to adopt these policies tonight. Yeah, well, you it's, part of a motion. it's one motion. Is it one motion to yeah. accept both? That's what I'm, that's my question. You can move to accept both. Okay. Move for approval as recommended. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, item 12. Point oh one has passed unanimously, no abstention. And we move to thirteen point oh one. Discussion and action to approve the contract for professional services over twenty-five thousand. Move to approve. Second. All, right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Item thirteen point oh one has passed unanimously, no abstention. Move to 14.01, discussion and action to approve variable term waiver request for certificate employee, Mr. Tom Wynn, acting associate superintendent. This, this, is, this is standard. This is standard, yeah. I'll move to approve. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, well, let, 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 let's say move by Chavez, second by. Uh, Patty Portisi. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, item 14.01 has passed unanimously and no abstention. We move to 14.03. Discussion. 14.02 already removed it. Yes. Uh huh. 14.03. Discussion and action to approve memorandum of understanding between Eastside Teacher Associations and the Eastside Union High School District regarding implementation of independent study ISP assignment for 2021-2022 school year. I just, I have a quick question about this. Um, so it said, I was a little confused by the sort of the caseload of the students. I mean, the teachers, because it says that they would be assigned five. Cor correct, for, for every period, um, it's five because our independent studies student ratio is 25 students to one full-time teacher. 25 students to one full-time teacher, because in essence, the, all students have five classes, right? Correct. Okay, so, so, but what was the one to five then? I didn't, I didn't quite so understand a, a, that. A full-time independent studies teacher has a caseload of 25. Okay. Our teachers teach five periods a day. Okay. So if they were only going to teach for one period and not five, that ratio would be five to one. Oh, so it's some basically teachers the are 25 going to have, divided by five. Okay, so some teachers are going to be teaching four classes plus one section of ISP, which is five students. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, Potentially. Got I got. Okay, that's how this is. That's how this is structured. Yes, this okay. is structured that. So if there is a case where there's a a need a need for that um, for it to be assigned the five, if there's a need for a six period assignment, that would be understood. It would be still be a caseload of five, and there's other provision. Okay. And then the six, the six period assignment would also incur the, the stipend that we agreed to or whatever in the last thing. The per diem rate, yes. Okay. All right. All right. I need a motion for the item 14.03. I'll move to approve. Second. All right. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Item 14.03 passed unanimously, no abstention. So we will go to consent calendar. Move for approval of the consent calendar. I'll second. All right. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 No abstention. 
And we move to item well, 21, just yeah, no written report. 22, anyone has any future agenda items? If not, then to 23. Okay, now um, the board trustee, superintendent, commission comments. So my right, so board member Cortese. Uh, it's it's great that I can still see daylight and we're wrapping up our meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it's dark now. Now, <laughs> it's dark I, enough. Hope, I hope that it's is a miracle. A trend that continues. Um, no, it's I'm. It's great to be back. Welcome back, everybody. I'm very excited to um, be bringing back our kiddos on campus. This is going to be monumental for for everyone. Yeah, great work. All right. Uh, board Vice President Manuel Herrera. It seems like just the other night we did the last June meeting, and it's already August. So, <laughs> although it's good to be back, another couple of weeks would have been nice. But <laughs> welcome back, everybody. Thank you. All right, Board Member Joe. It's really great to be back. I'm looking forward to seeing our students. I'm looking forward to seeing all the campus. Uh, last uh, last time I visit a lot of campus, but not that many students. So that's the one thing I'm looking forward to. Remember Travis? Yes, uh, really excited for day one of school. I can't believe, Glenn, when you said it's next week, I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm not even at the helm like, like y'all are. So I just want to express an immense amount of gratitude to everyone at you know all the layers right, just working hard from, you know, our cabinet to, you know, all the other, all the other layers here at the, at the district office and our school sites. My gosh, um, I know they're working their hearts out. And so just, uh, I want that to be known that it doesn't fall on deaf ears and we really appreciate it. And we are just as excited if not even, well, I, I can't say more because there's nothing like being on the school site with children. <laughs> Um, but just really excited and rooting for everybody to to excel. So can't wait to hear how amazing day one is going to be because it's going to be amazing. Um, so I'm just putting that out to the universe. Um, so, yeah. All right. So for me, um, I think the last two weeks, uh, I think board member Rara and I we attend uh, one of the the. the final day of a summer school at YB from the ELD3. I want to appreciate, say thank you to teacher Kaylin, um, activity director, uh, Mr. Chen, uh, YB principal and all the staff have been worked very hard during a summer school. And I know that uh, now we start as a new year, uh, 2021, 2022. Um, my expression here is, is um, you know, I know it's going to be a little bit of chaos, a little bit of pressure as of August 10. So I hope that everyone take a bit more time, really relax a little bit before we enter to the uh, August 10 um, is a reopening school. And I hope that we start, you know, with a good school. Uh, and we want to have all the support that we have. Uh, and all we need is uh, everyone have to work together so we can support students, support family, support staff, teachers, administrators. I can think enough that um, you know everything is working around the clock. Time went by so fast. We don't have any meeting in August. And looking around, it's like, oh my gosh, now we start all over again for the whole year. <laughs> Uh, you know, so I, uh, I'm glad that all my board members are very happy and being safe and uh, we're going to come back with those uh, Delta variant coming up here and I don't want to think anything anymore, but I hope that we're going to keep up, you know, with the school year and uh, work together and uh, work hard uh, for our students. So that's all I have. And so, uh, Mr. Vandersee, uh, your communication or comment? You know, I just, would, what, I, what we talked about in the presentation, I'm just, I'm thrilled that our, our staff and our, and our learners will be together. 
they're the right people for each other at the right time. And with just, I have full confidence that our staff and our community are gonna meet our learners after so much time away and re-welcome them to truly, our, our sites are the best places our, our learners could be right now. Um, students, we want you there. We're ready to meet you uh, with, with what you've gone through in the last year and a half. And we're ready to um, work together with you uh, for all the things that we know you're capable of. And, um, you know, in the last year, we've learned that leadership matters, that facts matter, that, you know, being clear about what we intend to do and backing that up. And I can't wait to work with a group of students and faculty to raise that next generation of Deciders that are ready to do that work in their communities and abroad. So welcome back. Let's welcome. Let's get to the work and um, let, let's do it together. Awesome. Um, so the next uh, item is 24.01 Legal Council will report and close session actions. Yes. Close session item 2.04. The board unanimously approved the appointment of Mayra Valdivia as associate. Really? Oops. How can we hear you? Really? We're having a hard time hearing you. How about now? Can we hear you? Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Uh, we cannot hear you. We we'll hear you. How about now? Hello. We're waiting on you, Mr. General Counsel. I'm, let's, can you hear Rogelio, me? Rogelio, we can hear you in the Zoom. I'm offsite as well. I can hear you in the Zoom. Um, okay. But they can't hear me in the they can't hear me in the boardroom. We can now. Oh, okay. Uh, closed session item two point zero four. The board unanimously approved the appointment of Mayra Valdivia as associate principal, James Lick High School, Anne Tran as dean of students, Independence High School, and Nuk Hung Do as dean of students at Foothill High School. There are no further actions to report. Congratulations to everyone. Okay, all right, um, no other business? I am adjourned the meeting. Thank you.